Welcome back, everyone. If you are wondering which Twilight Zone you ventured into, this is the Product Uncensored show with your host, Colin Pell. Now, first off, I want to wish all our Muslim viewers and listeners who are watching or listening, um, who are observing the fasting month, uh, Happy Ramadan or Ramadan Mubarak. Um, so yeah, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, Muslims are a majority in Southeast Asia and they're currently going through the fasting month. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really tough act, I have to admit. Like, I don't think I could ever do it. So I'm very thankful I don't have to do it. But for those of you who are observing, more power to you. All right, we've got a great guest on the show today, as usual. Um, but of course, as usual as well, we've got to go to the four commandments of the Product Uncensored show. So the first is I write at www.productuncensored.com. Now I'll freely admit that you know this year I haven't given that the the the, the medium site much love as I have last year, and I promise you that in the next month I will. Um, but yeah, I've got some some writings there. Um, if you'd like to watch um, these sessions, uh, we're available on YouTube. And if you are going to YouTube to check it out, please do me a favor, click on the subscribe link. And also when you subscribe, don't forget to click on that bell icon uh, at the side as well so that you're always notified when we have new uh, content coming out. Um, if you prefer to only listen, um, not, not to see my ugly mug of a face, that's great as well. We're on all major podcasting platforms. You should see it coming up, I think right here. I hope I've mastered that of getting the sites correct. Um, and finally, if you want to support this show, uh, this is all voluntary. There is a link in the description here. I think should be appearing now uh, where you can, you can support the show for the price of a coffee. Okay, we're done. And now I can actually get to the real interesting stuff, which is introducing our guest for today. Now, this person, he is a giant in the product management scene. He's also a literal giant in real life. He's known all around the product community, all around the world for his work. And he probably created the most famous Venn diagram in product management history. So he is the man, the myth, the legend, Martin Erickson. Welcome to the show, Martin. Thanks so much, Colin. And thank you for that intro. I think I've been so effusively introduced before. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to, you know write a nice intro. So I thought yeah, that, that, that would be fun. Um, so how, how are things, how are things in the UK, by the way? It's good. We're getting there. I think, um, you know, it's been a rough year of lockdowns and stuff like that, but things are finally opening up. We have some beautiful spring weather. Um, I've got my first shot, so it feels like there's light at the end of the tunnel and just hope the rest of the world can follow us. Yeah. Did, did you think that, you know, we would still be here one year after you know, the first lockdown happened definitely almost across the world. I definitely not. I think as as the pandemic started, even before it was a pandemic, everyone was like, oh, that's, you know, it's, it's a, uh, I think everyone thought it was going to be like SARS, like, oh, it's going to be a thing. It's in Southeast Asia. Okay. Like, and then it started spreading all over the world. And you're like, okay, this is a thing. And then came to Europe and we're like, okay, we're going to lockdown, but it'll be like, you know, a month. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it'll be three months. And yeah, here we are. What? 14, 15 months later. So yeah, I know. It's a crazy it's... year. It's been absolutely insane. I know even people that I speak to personally, like no one can actually imagine. Like I still remember telling my wife, right? You know, you we watch all these zombie movies about you know the apocalypse and how we're all stuck yeah. at home and it's like half dead people walking around. But essentially, this is the real zombie movie, except that there are no dead people, but there are people dying and we're all locked up at home. We don't know many of us are, are still not brave enough to to travel here and there you know flights are banned and th yeah. this is the real apocalyptic zombie movie right so also we can't make fun of zombie movies anymore right when we see those people like run away from the zombies like protect yourselves <laughs> like we know humanity just isn't smart enough to do that at this point so that is true <laughs> that is also true that is very very true yeah so you know, when 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 I was uh, when I was uh, just thinking about you know the the introduction as well, I, I was just kind of thinking back to I think the first time that we met in person. I think was in twenty nineteen in Singapore, um, and we're meeting at uh, was it Fullerton Fullerton Hotel? Was it? I think yeah, it was. Probably, yeah. yeah, and and I still remember. I was like, you, you, in the email, saying, you know, look for look for me. You know, I'm not hot, I'm not easy to miss or something like that. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I should probably recognize the face. 
I have to admit, I, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for like okay, all right, that that big dude over there is him. Like literally, I could not miss you. And so yeah, if, if those of you who haven't seen Martin in real life, like he looks, I mean, not to say he looks bad or anything, but it's just that yeah, he's really tall in real life. So that that was a real shocker for me. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, you're like that's what that's six six feet eleven or something. <laughs> Uh, six five, but that's it's tall enough. Um, yeah. and it's why my nickname, the big friendly giant, kind of stuck ever since high school. So, uh, but you, okay, so BFG stands for big friendly giant. You yeah. know that there's a BFG in the game called Quake, mm-hmm. which stands for something yes. very different. Yeah, which we probably shouldn't say on you okay. know, live yeah. television. But yeah, yeah, I mean, no, no, I'm just saying. Came after the BFG. The BFG is a, a classic book by Roald Dahl, right? So okay, that, that at least came out first. Okay, because because when I saw BFG, I was like, wow, you play quick <laughs> and you called yourself that. It's like, ooh, yeah. But we will we will not, you know, for for the sake of people who are watching this with kids around, yeah, we will keep it, you know, safe. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. You can go ahead and say whatever you want. This is the product consensus <laughs> show. I don't care. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, moving on. I, I wanted to start by just, um, you know, calling out a, a part of your life that I thought was really, really interesting. Um, because, you know, some people say like, hey, Martin, what's, what's the connection with Southeast Asia? And I always like to say that, you know, some way, somehow I'm going to tie it back to Southeast Asia. <laughs> um, and I thought it would be good for you to, to tell us a little bit about your story about where you grew up. Yeah, so my dad was an electrical engineer and kind of, I guess, got bored of Sweden at an early age. Uh, and it actually worked in Peru and Liberia before I was even born. And then I was born in Sweden, like the the only two year period. I think my parents actually lived and worked in Sweden together. And then uh, at 18 months old, we moved to Jakarta. So this is a very, very long time ago now. I was obviously a, barely a toddler, uh, but we lived in Jakarta for nearly three years and then moved to Nairobi for another couple of years. And then I ended up in Bangkok for nearly four years before doing some other countries, but I think it's through those kind of experiences in Jakarta and in Bangkok, I just fell in love with the region and, and in other places that we've lived, we've always traveled back. So part of my dad's kind of expat contract, which I'm not even sure exists anymore, uh, included kind of travel home, but we didn't really have a home to travel to in Sweden. So we would just, you know, go to Bangkok for Christmas or, you know, things like that. So spent a lot of time in the region. I just fell in love with it and was so excited to be able to come back and, and also to kind of see our, our community grow throughout the region, right? Very nice. So it, by your by your rough tally, right, how many countries have you lived in? So I've lived in nine countries. You're going to yeah. make me do math in my head now. So yeah, <laughs> nine or ten countries. Yeah, I think that's about the number of countries I've been through all around the world. But <laughs> yeah, so yeah. yeah, it was very interesting that that you, you actually not just, you know, you had your first three years in Indonesia and in Jakarta, but you also spent time in, in Thailand as well. Do you remember much about your, your, your growing up in Jakarta? I mean, it's the classic memories as a kid, right? It's like, I don't know how much of it's my memories versus, you know, we've been through photo albums and things like that as a family and my parents have told these stories. I, so I remember bits and pieces. Um, I, I think I remember more like the countryside and, and we, you know, we would go out into the, into the countryside quite often. Obviously we would travel to places like Bali and things like that as well. And, had lovely memories of those things, but I think most of my memories from Jakarta are probably more, you know, told by my parents. Okay. I definitely have much clearer memories from Bangkok. Okay. So I, it wouldn't be fair to ask you whether you prefer Jakarta or Bangkok. (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) Also, this was Jakarta like 40 years ago. So I'm, you know, it's a very, very different place today. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Let, let's let's get into the, the the good stuff, right? So, um, maybe maybe you can start by telling us, you know, how did you land your first product management gig? So I think it was basically middle '90s. I had just graduated high school, started university, was not enjoying my classes very much. So you know, was, I started uni in '95, just as the web was exploding. I'd already been building like websites and stuff just for myself, or you know, messing around with BBSs before that, all sorts of stuff. And I ended up spending more time in the computer lab, kind of building websites for like the first student newspaper website, the first like university website, like all of this stuff. And then decided to drop out. And oh, you know, I'll come back later. Was kind of the idea. 
moved to Stockholm and kind of started working for some startups as kind of a web designer, web developer, but kind of doing a little bit of everything as you do in startups and had titles like webmaster or website master and things like that. Ah, yes. Um, didn't even basically know that product was a thing until two startups later and uh, at the end of 99, I moved to London and joined Monster, the, the big job board as a product manager. And I was like, oh, oh, this is what I've been doing. This is like connecting the dots between, you know, design and engineering and the business and having all those conversations and trying to figure out what we need to build next, like all of that stuff. And so that's where I kind of learned the craft, I think, and very much now, you know, 21 years ago, very old school way of doing it, the wrong way of doing it, but at least that's kind of where I started that journey. Very nice. So when you when you decided to to join Monster, did you apply for the job or were you like hunted for the job? And and I, yeah, what did you? Why did you decide to take that job? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I applied for that job. It's so long ago now. Um, I'm pretty sure I applied for that job. I was applying for a few things. I knew I wanted to kind of leave Stockholm because uh, you know my international background. I just wanted to try something different. So. London was somewhere I wanted to move to. I had a bunch of friends who already lived here, all that kind of stuff. So I'm pretty sure I applied for a bunch of jobs in those kind of things. And I, at this point, you're probably going to ask me, but I wouldn't even remember like how I thought product manager sounded like a good idea. But I guess the job description would have been like a bit of a wake up call of like, oh yeah, I can do those things. That makes sense. And, you know, just seemed like the right fit at the time. And it turned out to be true. Yeah. It sounded like it sounded like a good idea, which I mean, yeah. 20 years on, it definitely was a good idea, right? So, yeah. And so then the big question that comes out of this is when did you create that Venn diagram? Was it, you know, monster? Was it after, you know, when did you create that legendary um, Venn diagram? It was definitely a lot later. I think it was, I probably created it first in about 2010 or something as a, you know, talking to people about what product was and the blog post that made it famous was published in 2011. So it's, it's now 10 years old. Um, but I think it, you know, the f first 10 years of my product career, I was definitely doing much more old school product, a lot of like product requirement documents, you know, spending six months writing the perfect spec and then throwing it over the wall to engineering and getting something completely different out the other end and, <laughs> you know, all the things we know not to do today, hopefully. Uh, and I did a monster for six years in a couple of different roles. Uh, and then I moved on to the Financial Times. And then it was uh, at a startup as the first kind of VP product at a startup that I really had to like step back and think about like, what is this role actually? And, and how does it fit in with everyone else? And what are the skills that we need in this team and things like that, that made me start thinking about the, the Venn diagram and, and how to define it. And and to start spreading that. Hmm. So why why did you choose the Venn diagram? Like what was the what was the inspiration? Was it because you know you were like scribbling on a tissue or a napkin or or yeah, was it was it like by design, by accident? It was definitely by accident and never intended it to blow up, obviously. But um I'm definitely a visual thinker and visual communicator. So I, I do a lot of like sketching stuff and I do a lot of like, you know, processing stuff on a whiteboard kind of thing with the team. So it just came out naturally of trying to define how how these things fit together and and the, I think predominantly when I'm when I think about the Venn diagram, I actually think about the skills needed in the product team as opposed to necessarily like the product manager sits in the center of this web and is you know in charge of these things or you know it's, it's it was never about like a, a supremacy thing or like product is in in charge of these other th disciplines or anything like that. It's very much focused on the skills needed as a whole in a product team. So. I guess it, I think it came out of kind of one of those whiteboarding sessions when we were trying to figure out how to build a team at that startup. What skills mm. do we need? Like, who else do we need? Okay, so I'm kind of definitely more in that UX bucket. So my next hire needs to be someone in the, you know, coming from the tech or the business bucket to make sure that it kind of complements my skills, things like that. Okay, okay. All right, two, two, two more questions, I think. I, in my head, there are two, but hopefully there's only two and then we'll move on. So the first question is, how, do, like, how does it make you feel to to after all these years still be so associated with that diagram do you like do you do you even care or is like a, is that like you wish something else would be different or like yeah i feel i mean it's pretty surreal to see it popping up all over the place and you know unassociated with me and, and people using it to you know discard product and sometimes not exactly the way i would use it to describe it but it's definitely surreal that it's kind of taken on a life of its own and you know, I have massive imposter syndrome for most of everything that I've done. And I think definitely for that of like, oh, well, this is just a sketch. I'd think like, 
okay, fine. I, I, it resonated. That, that's awesome. And it's kind of awesome to hope that it's helped a lot of people understand what it is that we do. Um, mm. But yeah, it was never intended. And I think um, it's a very surreal experience sometimes when you see other people, you know, use it to explain the craft that I love um, mm. without knowing that, you know, I was, I was the one that created it when they're using it to explain it to me kind of thing. <laughs> so so it has actually happened? Like somebody tried to explain back to you using the diagram you created? Or not necessarily explain it to me because obviously they, they would they knew that I've, I do the product thing, but um, I've definitely had people, you know, have it indexed or something. They're like, and, and as everyone knows, like, this is what product looks like. And so this is what, what we're thinking about. I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I recognize that. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, it look, looks familiar. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So last question on this. So you said it came out around 2011 and yeah, I think yeah. that's where that, that blog post came up. Yeah. So now it's 2021. So it's like what, 10 years have passed. Do you think that diagram still holds true? What would you change or what would you not change about it? I think it probably does still hold true. I would um, more than anything, probably encourage as everything else, right. Is like, read the manual like read the actual post because I, I looked at it recently because it is almost 10 years old now and, and actually i think it still holds true and it, it is kind of emphasizing all those things around product not being um at the center of this in terms of you know control or management like it's it is a team sport it's about mm. bringing together these skill sets into one team etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think the only thing i would change is the caveat of like make sure you actually read the thinking behind it as opposed to just using it blindly um, I think the other thing I would maybe add is like, and I do this in some talks showing that, you know, there's probably five or six or more circles that you could draw in there as well, like all overlapping, but it starts becoming a bit ridiculous, right? But there's, you know, data science, there's product marketing, there's, there's so many other skill sets that we do need to bring to bear today in a team. Um, but I say, I still think those three are, are the core. Yeah, I mean that's the beauty I think of the diagram. Right? It's it's in the simplicity. Like I saw one one I can't remember when I saw it. I think it was a few weeks back. Just like he there was like he drew like you know I don't know like what looked like ten circles and I was like this is the real deal. It's like yeah I think we know that, but it's just that you know it's easier to explain it to someone who doesn't understand by using three yeah. versus you know ten or twenty circles. So yeah, so I mean thank you thank you so much for that because that's actually one of the first few diagrams that I actually um, found when 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 I first started quite a while back as well um so yeah thank thank you so much for that so now moving on i wanted to ask you so in your product career right when you moved from a i think you moved from monster to then the financial times yeah. then you moved to huddle right so yeah. was huddle your first like leadership role um yeah i think it was like my first um i guess senior leadership role right as a vp product mm, and mm. creating a, a the function from scratch but i definitely had you know fairly senior positions at the financial times but not you know i wasn't the vp or the cpo but i was, okay. I was kind of in charge of the whole classifieds business at the financial times mm. and then at monster before that so originally i was just a just you know one of many product managers in the european team uh going from like four countries to 18 countries and, and kind of growing that business and then the last three years I spent at Monster, I was actually in charge of the, what we call the solutions business, which is kind of a very early software as a service kind of applicant tracking system, mm -hmm. white label job board, like okay. selling into big enterprise yeah. customers, that kind of thing. And so in that, I, you know, I was in charge of that, but of course that was a tiny part of the overall Monster machine. So it wasn't like I was the ultimate product leader or anything like that. Yeah, but I mean, like Monster back back in those days, they were huge, weren't they? They were like yeah. like number one in the world then and all that. Yeah, I think we that. grew to about a, a billion dollars in revenue by the time I left, sort of thing. And again, not taking credit for any of that it was a you know several mm. thousand people in the company at that point as well, and, and a global presence. But yeah, it was mm. an exciting journey to be part of yeah. at the time. Yeah, the the question I was actually wanting to ask you was, you know, what was you know what what would be the main difference or differences moving from that you know, perfecting your single contributor craft into this role where you're, you're a leader, you're also a people manager. Yeah. What would the, what was the hardest part? Yeah. I think it's the, I think for any product person making that leap, it's really rethinking what your job is, right? Cause you're suddenly not responsible for the product anymore. You're responsible for the team and the people that create the product. Right. And 
I think a lot of our thinking and experience and knowledge can come in, you know, super useful in terms of thinking about how to iterate on that and how do we improve the process and how do we involve the team in that conversation and how do we manage our team as a product kind of thing. But it is a very big shift and it's, especially for me as I still, you know, love getting hands on and building stuff, right? I, I love designing stuff and I'm still every once in a while jump into code and things like that. But you really have to leave that behind when you, when you go from an I, even as an IC product manager, you shouldn't be doing that. But definitely as a product leader, like you are not responsible for the day to day of, of what your team is building. You're responsible for setting them up for success and giving them what they need in order to go build the best product. So it's a big mind shift, I think. And it's not something everyone uh, is good at. And that's probably a good thing. That's, that's fine. I think that's why we are seeing more and more, you know, senior ICs or distinguished product managers or, or whatever the title is that lets you be a fantastic product manager, but just be responsible for a very important part of the product or to also be a coach on the product's craft and things like that, but still be hands-on and be recognized that that can be a, a senior career path as well. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think that two two episodes ago, I got Sharif on the show. Like he's mm, uh, yeah. he used to be an IC um, yep. at a, an Alaskan for for a long time. Actually, by the time I interviewed him, he he'd already had some people management duties, but he he was an IC for for a long time. And I think that's a very interesting. I won't even say interesting. I think it's a positive development in the product management world Definitely. because um, for a long time, and, and, and in actual fact, I think in Southeast Asia it still has a lot of that connotation that if you want to go up the ladder, you're going to have to be like a people manager. Yeah. And there's a lot of, I won't say it's very explicit, but you, if you were to say, I'm a product leader with a team of X, as opposed to I'm a single individual contributor product leader, there's a very big difference in the way people would respond to you. So I think, you know, as, as hopefully, you know, as we catch up to, to, to more mature product countries, I think it'd be really great to see more individual contributors who are really, you know, just zone, honed in on their craft and just being good yep. at what they do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, we can take a lot of lessons from our friends in design and engineering on that front, right? Engineering has that kind of architect track for the individual contributor, you know, technical excellence, all focused on the craft versus the CTO track, which is much more about the people management. Mm. Uh, design has similar things. And it's still going to be, you know, there's obviously room for less people at that level, but I think it is fantastic to have, you know, and Sharif's a fantastic example of this, uh, a really excellent IC who doesn't want to stop being, you know, hands-on as part of a product team mm. and that they can grow in their career and they can be compensated accordingly as well um, and kind of lead the organization, but from a craft perspective as opposed to a people perspective, I think it's, it's a really good pro progression. Yeah, actually, I think you touched on a really good point, right? Part of the part of the difficulty of trying to create this indi individual contributor track is whether or not the the people who hold the purse strings actually value the the contribution as much as a people manager would. And yeah, yeah I think that's 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 a big challenge that we need to overcome to sort of you know tell the story of the value that this person brings. And just because he or she is not handling a team, it doesn't mean that they are any less valuable. Uh, in that yeah. sense so yeah it's definitely and especially you know i think sharif um has done a couple of talks on it and and he's shown like how atlassian thinks about it and they have the the kind of ladder concept that you know you, you you're on the same rung as um you know a vp and you're paid accordingly and everything else but you're still a you know you're a distinguished product manager or, or whatever the title is um and then re therefore responsible for you know probably one of the most important products or problem areas in the product and obviously that has a huge impact on the business outcome as well so that yeah. should be compensated accordingly. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Yeah, I, I was just telling Sharif when he came on the on the show, like if you were to like type um, what is product management, his video actually turns up at number one. And every time I go to YouTube every now and then, that same video keeps popping up. It just popped up again last week. So it is sure proof that what he's done is has really had a great impact. Um, I would say probably that's the second most recognizable thing next to the Venn diagram that you created. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So speaking of uh, Venn diagrams and, and product management, right? So um, as everyone should know, and if you don't know that Martin started Mind the Product, please go check it out. Um, how how did that come about? You know, what what made you decide to, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming here of, you know, you suddenly deciding one day that, hey, I want to do this. Yeah. What, how did it come about? Uh, it, I mean, it... <laughs> 
again, never intended to be that big. Uh, it started as Product Tank, the the meetup, and it started in 2010. So when I was at that startup, uh, Huddle here in London, and it, as most people who have been in a startup know, when you're a product person, you're probably pretty lonely, right? Um, my joke is always that like the engineers were ganging up on me and the designers just made fun of me, and I had no one to talk to about like product stuff, right? Because I hadn't built the team yet, and so it started from that point of. You know, I'm trying some new things. We're experimenting with autonomous teams. Like we're doing all this stuff, but I have nobody else to talk to who has that product perspective. So just wanted to meet other product people. And, you know, we started with 25 people in the back room of a pub here in London. Um, my boss gave me like a couple hundred pounds to like buy some beers and managed to get a room behind that pub. And yeah, that's, that's all I ever wanted it to be, to be honest. I mean, a lot like the meetup that you have in KL, right? Of like, just want to be able to meet other people, share some lessons learned, get to, you know, ask some questions, figure out how to do this craft of ours, right? Mm. And again, I, I thought that's probably where it would have stayed, except other people obviously felt this need as well. And so it very quickly grew within a year to about 100 people coming to this meetup every month. And this was still in and London, that, yeah? This is still in London. Okay. Um, and then in uh, 2011, we started wanted to start a blog to kind of start connecting the dots between the meetups. And for some reason, we decided we should give it a different name. So it became Mind the Product. And again, it's showing our London roots. So the joke was like, Mind the Gap is obviously one of the famous symbols for London. So Mind the Product, yeah, that'll be great. Um, little, again, thinking that it would ever go international. And somewhere around there, you know, I think, again, because London's such an international city that people were coming to the product tank and then moving home. So I think the first two outside of London were Amsterdam and Manchester. And that was because people had been coming to the London meetup and were like, oh, well, I'm moving back here. There's nothing like that here. Can we start something like this? And we're like, yeah, OK, cool. Like, here's here's how to think about it. We know you. We trust you that, you know, you have the right or the same way to think about product that we do. Here's some tools to get up and running and, and go with it. And so. That's that's just how it kind of grew up. Mm. So how did you or when did you decide that, you know, hey, we should, you know, sort of branch out? Like what yeah, you know, how did you know there was time to multiply? I think it I mean it, so the product tank multiplication's always been incredibly organic, right? We've never done, you know, we never go out to find anyone. We never, you know, we've never been marketing it or anything like that. It's always been people coming to us and saying, I want to start this in my city because I need the help or I want to meet other product people. And so I think it was, yeah, it was probably 2011, 2012 that we kind of formalized because we were starting to get more requests of like, how do we do this? Do we like, how do we want to set this up? And the only bit that we've actually formalized is that we want to make sure that anyone who starts a product tank has the same thinking about it, that they are practitioners that want to meet other practitioners. So, you know, we've, we've said no to agencies and we've said no to, vendors and things like that because we don't mm. want them to kind of own the meetup in their in their city and so we just have some like light rules like that around um what kind of a meetup and what kind of a community it should be um, but other than that and um, we try to support our our meetups all over the world so we pay for their meetup fees we you know help them out by introducing me to each other and helping uh, find speakers and all that kind of stuff but the growth was really just purely organic and still is to this mm. day. Like, I think there was definitely an inflection point somewhere in 2014, 2015, where we kind of went from 2030 to, you know, over 100. And now we're at 216 cities around the world, which is insane. Yeah. Um, but it's all been driven by organic growth, basically. Nice, nice. Okay. And then Mind the Product really grew as a, as a side thing again of just, okay, 2012, we're like, how do we get these, you know, the big famous speakers over in the US, how do we get them to come to our meetup? It's like, okay, well, we probably have to pay them for their travel at least. And and ideally we'd like to pay them, you know, a speaker fee or something. Hmm. So we're like, okay, well then we have to sell tickets. Like, you know, I guess we're doing a conference, right? And that's that's literally the thought process that went into our first conference in London, uh, where we had about 450 people. And again, just kind of grew from there. And it wasn't until 2015 that it stopped being a hobby even, I think for those first five years. And mm. until our first SF conference, it was still a hobby. We were just doing it as, as a side business, right? Like my co-founders, Jan and Simon, were running their own startup. Um, I was, you know, VP product at various startups. And we were just doing this on the side. So it wasn't until 2015 that we kind of realized that, oh, shit, this is actually a thing now. And, and maybe, like, <laughs> we need to treat this a little more seriously and, you know, set up a company and, and you know, 
uh, a few of us went full time to actually try to scale it up and and stabilize it. I think as much as anything, right? So mm. we're still a small team, but it's more about kind of building a, a stable core to be able to support that community really. Yeah, yeah. I, you, actually, the the what you've mentioned is very very nice because it it kind of dovetails into what I wanted to ask. Right? How how did you manage to handle, or, or rather, I, I think it's you and your the the team that 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 were running it to do it as a part time job because it, it, it this wasn't just running a meetup, right? This was literally having conferences, churning out content for my the product website, and also at the same time trying to support the various product tanks that were growing all, all around in cities all around the world, right? How how did you yeah. manage that? I mean, the the those first five years were definitely, you know, it was a passion project. I mean, to a large degree, it still is because it doesn't pay what I could do doing other things. So like, it's still <laughs> very much a passion project, but um you know we cared just cared deeply about the craft and wanted to meet other people and and saw a lot of value for us in learning how to do this better and wanted to share that with everyone else and then it became very you know community driven so mark abraham joined us early on again as a volunteer to kind of help other product tanks get up and running uh the conferences you know one of the things we've always done with our conferences is we hire up um event managers and things like that and producers and stuff to actually run the thing because again that's not our our core skill set nor how we are best utilized so we were able to do it fairly light touch but you know there were definitely moments of asking ourselves what the hell we're doing as we're sitting there at 1 a.m kind of putting together you know i think we were printing and hand sticking badges and you know i i had basically still today done most of the design work for our conferences but then like get, going to the printer getting it from the printer hanging it up in the venue like all that stuff that we did in the early days so uh, I think it, there was a point where we're like, why are we doing this? But ultimately it was just a great way to learn and, and meet other product people. So we just okay. love doing it. Yeah. And for you personally, right? Because in 2015, like that's when, uh, I think that's when you decided to sort of, you know, do take mind the product full time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how hard was it to, to, to make that decision and, why why you and not you know not the other two co-founders to to you know sort of take it forward yeah i think it was definitely a, a moment where we had just done our first conference in san francisco so you know the second conference outside of london and realized that this wasn't just a london thing i think that was the big wake-up moment and you know going to san francisco you feel like well it's the valley right like why do they need a, a pro like they should don't they have a product conference they, they should be able to sort this out themselves um, and then getting the success that we did in that first year, I think we had 700 people in San Francisco the first year, the tickets sold out in like a week or two, which is insane. And we mm. actually had nearly 600 people on the waiting list after that. And we're like, but we can't actually physically fit you in the venue kind of thing. <laughs> so that was definitely the wake up call of like, okay, there's, there is something big here. There's something useful on an international level here. And I had just finished uh, another startup job in Boston uh, for Covester wanted to come back to London and was kind of in the you know quandary of like, what do I want to do with my life? And what do I want to do next? And like, should I take another startup job? Or is this a thing that we can build up to something? And just decided to take the plunge. It wasn't an easy decision at the time. It was definitely like, you know, it was risky. And I took a massive pay cut to do it, like classic startup founder thing. Mm. Um, but we just believed that we could build a, a good little business. Like we've never been in it to get rich or anything like that. There's, there's never going to be a, a massive like, financial outcome for this but it's more about building up a team and building up a, a company that can like i said sustainably support the community right so it was a it was a big bet um it's worked out well and i think it's also you know in parallel been very good for me in terms of like my career and my visibility and personal brand and things like that that has allowed me to do the other things that i'm now doing um so i think that's been the the, the major kind of career benefit as opposed to you know, building a highly profitable company or anything like that, because mm. that was never kind of really the goal. Okay, so would would it be fair to say that you know doing this as a something that started off as a passion project, which is now kind of I would say it's your job, is would would it be more fulfilling than you know having worked in your other roles? I think so. I think for me personally, it's it's definitely been part of a, a career progression from, you know, we were talking earlier about moving from IC to a, a product leader. I realized early on that I really enjoyed that part of like 
helping other product managers be great at what they do, you know, building up their success. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's very much what we try to do with Magna Product as well. But as my career has progressed, I've actually feel like my passion now is actually helping other teams, right? So I've done it as a consultant and now for um, a VC firm, like that is my job is actually helping other teams and kind of coaching them to be uh, the best possible product teams that they can be, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost a natural part of that progression of doing that through uh, my other product as well of helping other teams and helping other product managers around the world kind of realize what they can do with this craft. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, we will go into to to the VC part of your role because that's actually something that I find very interesting. So we'll definitely go into that. But um, I wanted to ask you this curious question, on, and this is more from me than anything else, right? What is it like to do product for a product community platform, <laughs> right? It's yeah. It's <laughs> it has its challenges. For for one thing, we're a tiny team we literally have one developer so like very much you know in many ways we're not doing product the right way because we just don't have the resources um and in many ways we're doing so much product because you know there's so many product managers in the company that like we all have opinions we're all talking to customers and we're all trying to figure out like what we should do um it's also hilarious sometimes because our customers are product managers right and so the feedback that we get is very different to any other company that i've ever worked for because <laughs> you kind of get either super detailed like oh what about this and i understand the constraints but this use case for this use, and you're like oh yeah okay that's great like you, th- 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 these are customers that we can actually just be like yeah that's a great feature let's go let's go do that thing um so it's, it's very different in many ways but it's it's also kind of very edifying to to see that response and um, yeah, to to get great feedback like that just means that people care, right? So, mm. uh, it's been a... yeah. Were there any like? Did you think that you know? Sorry, no. Let me let me let me phrase this properly because this question came in my head now to <laughs> think about it properly. Um, what product did did you follow? Like any product templates or you know product um, um, journeys? You know, or did, did you take? take stock from any of the other companies or, or things like that to sort of help maneuver your way to building um, mind the product? I think in, in many ways, it's not, you know, until recently, uh, we haven't really been building a lot of product. It's, it's really been building a service and an experience and things like that. Mm-hmm. So a lot of our focus has been on experience design and, and kind of figuring out like, what is it that makes a great conference or a great event and, and a great meetup? Um, and then thinking a lot about content. And so I think, I think we've probably been more inspired from like those kind of design disciplines of, you know, user journeys and, and user experience journeys, things like that. We do a lot of, we've done a lot of journey mapping and things. And uh, I think the biggest product thing that we do is obviously just try to be as attuned to uh, what the community and, and what our craft needs. So talking to, to, talking to our customers, right, which are our conference attendees and our, our readers and our audience and our community as much as we can to get a sense of, you know, what do they need help with? What are, what are the challenges? Like, what's the kind of content they're interested in? What's, what's going to um, attract them, get them engaged? But fundamentally, you know, we've, we've articulated our mission as making product people more successful. So like, that's the kind of question that we want to answer all the time. It's like, what, what's going to help make you more successful? Like, is it content? Is it training? Is it a certain speaker on stage? You know, things like that. So it's a very different kind of product in that way, because we're not really building a lot of, you know, code or software. Mm-hmm. It's really building an experience and a, and a service over time. So it has similar, similar skills needed, I think, but it's a very different way of working, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So let, let's, let's move on from, from mind the product uh, into, you know, the thing that you do on the side, or I don't know which one is the side and which one is the main, but you... <laughs> about 50, 50 at the moment. So. Okay. All right. So you're actually in a VC company, equity ventures, I believe it's called. Um, and you are the, well, you started off as the CPO in residence, right? Um, so the interesting question is, what is a CPO in residence? Because um, I've heard of entrepreneur in residence. I've never seen CPO in residence. So yeah, what what yeah. is that? I think the, officially the title was EIR, but we realized, so most VC firms, when you have an EIR, the idea is that, you know, it's a founder or a CEO that's just exited a company. They don't quite know what they want to do next, but the VC firm knows that they trust this person and they're like, they 
come hang out with us for you know a year or so and maybe help some of our teams but also while you're figuring out what you'll build next and we'll write the first check for you as you go build that thing so that was kind of the title that, that we had for it but I just kind of missold it and people didn't really understand because i wasn't there to build a startup right i was kind of there to help our portfolio companies so mm -hmm. made up the title of cpo and residence and really because that's kind of what i've been doing for the last couple of years of really helping all of our portfolio companies with those challenges and often we go in at the a round uh, and invest uh, in businesses and that's naturally an inflection point where they need a first product person right until that point generally the founder has been the product person or one of the founders has been the product person and this is the point where they're scaling and they're you know growing past 20 30 people they need to start splitting into multiple dev teams they need to start building a product process and a product function and so it's been a very natural fit for me to kind of come in and help and sometimes kind of be an interim CPO of like actually helping them do stuff, but most of the time helping them just build up that team and, and find the right fit for them, um, find and then coach through that inevitable kind of transition from the founder letting go of their baby a little bit and, and trusting the product person that's coming in and, and managing that relationship. Hmm. So that's really why we ended up calling it kind of CPO in residence because um, just trying to show that like, you basically get access to the CPO to, to help you build up that team um, to our portfolios. Okay, okay. Um, I wanted to to sort of discuss a little bit more about something that you said just now, right? Because you were saying that part of your role is to help the founder transition to that first yeah. product person. And that is something, a common thread that I hear a lot, um, especially in this part of the world, right? Where, mm. you know, product people join companies and realize quite quickly that the center of influence for all things product does not lie with the product lead, or even if, if they were the product lead that was hired, but that center of influence still resides within the, the CEO or the founder, yeah. right? Either yeah. one. So in your experience, having helped people to do that, what do you think is the most important thing for a product leader who's, who's joined such an organization and trying to move that center of, of influence for things around product uh, to, to become that expert. And at the same time, not make it seem like you've taken away, you know, like you're not baby snatching or, you know, cradle snatching or something, <laughs> anything of that sort. Yeah, yeah I think it's, um, there's also, so I'll start at one end. I think there's a real big misconception among founders, especially that, you know, when they get to that stage, they need to go hire, a, you know, someone who's already a VP product or a CPO and, Often here in Europe, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same in Southeast Asia, you hear like, oh, we need someone from like Google or Facebook, like, you know, one of those big valley names, right? And actually, a lot of what I do is to kind of walk founders back from that, because I think that's where you get massive conflict, right? Because if you hire someone who is, um, actually, if you hire someone from that size of company, they're not going to know what to do with themselves in a 20-person startup anyway. It's a very <laughs> different kind of product craft. Yeah. Um, but also, I think you need to get a, a, the right match between kind of product vision and product execution. Hmm. And I think in a bigger company, you want the product leader to all, like be very product visionary and be the person who's thinking about where is this going in five, 10 years, you know, setting out that vision and, and being very much responsible for it. In a startup, you still want the founder to do that because they got to wherever they are today because the founder had some insight or had some experience or had a vision for how this could be done better. And you don't want to take that away too early. So for me at that stage when it is the first proper product person coming into a startup it's much more about finding someone who loves the execution piece right again being hands-on maybe it's an ic who has some people ex leader experience or a senior product manager that kind of thing that can actually just come in and help execute and you know stabilize and clarify kind of what the process is how do we make prioritization decisions all that kind of day-to-day -day stuff as opposed to i'm going to come in and be the steve jobs of the startup and like come up with the amazing vision because like that's what the founders are doing. And that's where you inevitably see conflict as well. When you kind of mm. hire someone who, where that is a mismatch of vision versus execution. And then as the company scales, I think over time, that product leader can grow into the role or you, you hire someone more senior later on that can kind of take on a bit more of that visionary role and, and like take it to the next 10 years kind of thing. But in the early days, I think it's incredibly important to actually respect the fact that the founders had some kind of unique insight or some unique vision of the world that got the company to where it is today and that got that round of funding. And, you know, we, you shouldn't take that away too early, basically. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That, that is a very, 
different answer to be honest from from you know how how i've heard you know many people talk about their experience yeah, hmm. yeah. thank you so much for that um all right I th- so i think sorry to interrupt but i think it's you know it's because i've been in that role a couple of times right i've been mm. the first vp product coming into a company and, and taking over from founders and and having that struggle of like understanding how i best fit in and, and how i can be most impactful as a company it doesn't mean that i don't want anyone you know it, you still want people who have vision and things like that. It's just being very clear that in the early days, your vision is going to be subsumed by the founder vision. Like it just, it's just, it's mm. just the nature of the thing and that, you know, they own a big chunk of the company, but also they have had some unique insight that got them to where they are today. Mm. So in the early days, you need to respect that and trust that and, and work with that and then help them figure out how do we communicate that? How do we articulate that? How do we clarify it? So everyone understands and do all the other things that we talk about around team alignment and, the process and prioritization but fundamentally you're not necessarily coming in to reinvent the wheel right you're just helping them execute it better hmm. so sorry actually now now that you mentioned it now 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 that another question <laughs> came up so would it be fair to say that you know if you were going into such an arrangement where it's an early stage startup maybe just did it did a series a or maybe it's a you know pre-series a and you're going in at that stage that you should understand that your role is going to be very different. And if you wanted to really sort of do the whole visionary thing and, and go into this full strategy mode, you probably have to go through, you know, go through the fire, so to speak, of doing the execution and then biding your time, building the company, and then get to a stage where now the the, the CEO or the founder is is you know a lot more consumed by other things and has to sort of hand it over in that sense. I think to some extent, I think it's also, you know, as, as with everything in, in product, it depends. Uh, there's, no, there's no black and white, right? It, it so depends on the, the founders and, and how they think about things and, and where they want mm. to add value, right? Mm. I think mm. often successful startups that we see often have a very product-minded founder, even if they don't have product management experience. Like it is someone who has that, you know, sense and has that understanding of like how to make something customer focused. They really understand the problem. They're trying to solve over the opportunity in the market. So you don't want to necessarily replace that. Uh, I think, you know, I, I want to be clear, like the person that we tend to bring in at that stage is definitely intended to be involved in those conversations and like be part of the strategy conversations. And, and again, articulating that vision and that idea is incredibly important and something not all founders are great at. So mm-hmm. helping them with that, it's just that you're not replacing them, right? It's not. And I think that's what sets up that tension often in startups of like, we bring in a super senior product leader, and they think that they have to set up the strategy and set up the vision and everything else. And the founder might have a slightly different view on it. And that's just going to set up tension and, and not mm. set you up for success, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, those are really, really nice words of wisdom. Yeah, so I think for, for listeners and viewers, you know, I think take into that into account when you're looking for that role. I think in my point of view, I think these kinds of roles are great because you really get to learn. Like you're going to be hands-on with a lot of things. Um, but I think as Martin said, one of the very interesting things is that you're not going in to straight away be this, you know, product superstar and do everything. But a lot of the times you have to understand what the company needs and be what the company needs at that point yeah. in time. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I think it's having that conversation, right, as part of the hiring process on both sides, right? Whether you're the the founder trying to hire a product person or you're the product person trying to, considering a startup, it's like, have the conversation of, where does the CEO or founder want to spend their time? Like maybe they are a super business driven strategist and they should be in charge of the strategy, but focused on building the rest of the organization, or maybe they are actually, a, you know, a, a designer or something in the, as a background. So they should be super involved in the, the product vision and the UX and, and what you're working on. And it's just understanding like the best trade-off that you can find on that and, and having that conversation up front because you don't want to start in the company and then discover later that there's a mismatch, right? Because that just mm. sets everyone up for failure. Yeah, it's very true. It's very true. I, I definitely agree on that. You know, having that very frank and blunt conversation of what the company needs. Um, yeah. I think that's where, you know, a lot of our Asian-ness comes out where we like to sort of tippy-toe around these conversations. And, you know, when, once we hear what we like to hear, it's like, oh, I think this is right and then you go in and like oh so yeah i definitely agree yeah. yeah okay okay um so your role in in equity has changed a little bit you're now the sort of operating partner and so again i'm just very curious to know what does an operating partner do and how has that 
differed in terms of you know being a CPO in residence? Yeah. So for me, it's definitely been just a, a deeper involvement with the firm. And I think it's moved from being very focused on portfolio companies and, and kind of helping them. And, you know, we, be, we believe in the value of that value add to also, so I'm, I'm still doing that, but also kind of doing deal work really. So I'm now much more involved in eventually trying to help find deals. But right now, a lot of like having those, you know, due diligence type conversations when we're looking at deals, trying to understand like, does this make sense? Do we agree with the vision? Do we agree with the strategy? Do we agree with where they're going? Mm. Assessing the teams to understand, like, do they think about product the way we want them to think about product? Do they understand their their gaps, what, what they need to hire for, all those kind of things. So just being much more involved on the deal side and and therefore having an impact on who we choose to work with and who we choose to invest in. Okay, okay. I've got one more question about your your work with with a VC, and I promise I w- I will move on. If let's say there is <laughs> there is a company or you know a product that you know equity really looks like they really like it, but this is a this is some uh, a product that has grown and managed to succeed without having a product team, and you want to invest. And if let's say you say, hey, I think it's time for you to you know start building a product team. And the founder says, "Well, how about no?" Um, because so the, let me let me give you a little bit of context as to where I'm coming from. So there's this story where I've heard about this um, startup that did very well, and they they became successful and they were looking for funding. And one of the conditions that the VC firm put on them was that you need to build up your product practice or your product team as well. And what happened was, you know, they, they went around trying to hire, but they were quite half-hearted about it, right? So in those cases, doesn't it feel like that works to the detriment of the company as opposed to helping them grow? No, absolutely. And I think, I, I, I don't think we've ever been faced with that kind of black, again, black and white decision of like, oh, we're not going to invest because they refuse to hire a product team. But I think it would be, uh, it's definitely a conversation to have and understand why they don't think it's important. Uh, and fundamentally recognizing as well that if they don't have a product team, someone's still doing the product job, right? Whether it's yeah. the founder or it's the engineers, somebody's doing that job of mm. making prioritization decisions, trying to figure out what are we building next? What is the opportunity? Like all the stuff that a product manager does. So it's understanding like how those questions are being answered today and, and whether there's an improvement to be had by by hiring a product manager, which of course I would believe that there is. Mm. Uh, and just having a conversation with the founders about, about that, right? Mm. And I think... I mean, there, there are several startups that have grown super successfully without that. I think Stripe is one of the most famous examples where in the early days, they didn't have product managers. They, you know, they believed as a developer-focused product that their developers should be the product managers. Again, they didn't have the titles, but they were doing that job mm-hmm. so that they could best respond to their developer customers and users. Over time, they have added a product function. But, you know, I think that it, it again, just shows that there is no black and white yes or no answer. Yeah. I think fundamentally, when I go in to make those assessments, it's much more about understanding whether the founders realize who's making those decisions. How do you, you know, is that a clear process? Does everyone understand why we're making those decisions? You know, that it's the clarity of it. I think that's the most important thing for me. And um, in many ways, I don't, you know, I, I probably care less of whether they hire a product manager or not, then they have a clear process for how those decisions are being made. And inevitably, that just means somebody has to come in and, and make those decisions. So um, I don't think I'd ever be that black and white about it. But I do fundamentally believe that the best teams, cross functional teams work together and, and need that, you know, product part to uh, be a counterpart to the designer and en- engineering on the team. So hmm. um, yeah, I've never been faced with that. So who knows how I might respond, but um, I don't think I would be, you know, a flat out no. But at the same time, if a founder was, you know, that adamant about it, I'd want to understand why. And fundamentally, one of the things we do look for in, in our companies that we invest in is kind of coachability, right? Because the whole point is we want to help them on that journey. But if they're so set in their ways, then we can't mm. really add value to that. And, and we might, mm. you know not meet uh, eyes on something else later down the road as well. So that would probably be the red flag as opposed to whether or not they're specifically refusing to hire a product or anything like that. Good points. Good points. All right. Okay. I promised I'll move on. So we shall move on, right? Okay. Let's, let's talk about something more recent um, and that is COVID, right? So first of all, um, one of the things that, you know, um, I definitely want to know more about is how, 
you know, mind the product was impacted by, you know, the whole COVID situation because mind the product has, I mean, aside from product tank, you know, which, which are basically very organic and, you know, cities running their own meetups, but mind the product has built such a strong brand, especially in, in the conference. And I can, I can imagine that that would have really hit, you know, the, the, the company hard. So Absolutely. yeah, what, what, what happened and, and, and how did you guys deal with it? Yeah, I think, you know, we were, um, we started last year with, with big plans. It was our 10th anniversary year. Uh, we had, you know, four conferences on sale uh, and if we would, you know, a fifth one planned. And I think it was in February, we were in Manchester kind of running that conference when the, the first kind of signals started coming that, you know, this was more than just uh, in China, that, you know, the first couple of cases had been uh, reported in Singapore and other places. Uh, even at that conference in Manchester in February, there were a couple of people who were flying in from somewhere else in Europe and couldn't or decided not to because their their company wouldn't let them travel because this was going on. And I think that's the that was the wake up call that something was happening, right? And the, mm. only a, kind of a week after that, we ended up having to cancel our March conference in Singapore. Um, you know, offered everyone refunds and things like that, but kind of had to cancel the conference because we realized that travel was just going to be too difficult. Uh, and again, at this at this point, it was still kind of confined to Southeast Asia and Asia. So we thought maybe that's that's all we will have to do. But we were monitoring it, obviously. And then, it, you know, it, as we all forget at this point, I think it, how quickly this moved. Right. It was only hmm. like a couple of weeks later that there, we went from, oh, there's two cases in Singapore to like all of Southeast Asia is locked down. And now there's cases in the U.S. and Europe and, you know, everywhere else in the world. And that's when uh, we started figuring, you know, we were already talking about, okay, what are, what are our contingency plans? How do we like shut down our San Francisco conference, which is normally in July and our London conference, which is normally in, in September, October, we thought would still be fine at that point. And we're like, oh, that's so far away. It'll, it'll be fine. But the big kind of alarm for us was um, there was at one point, so we sell all our tickets through Eventbrite. And actually until that point, 90% of our revenue was from conference ticket sales. Um, and we sell all our tickets through Eventbrite and they made a decision overnight to stop what they call advanced payouts. So when you're a decent customer of Eventbrite, they will actually give you 90% of the revenue as cash flow. So you get that a payout every week or two. Um, and they'll hold back 10% in case of cancellations and stuff. For most customers, it's the other way around. They might give you 10% of the cash and hold 90% in case you end up canceling. So they ended up halting that overnight. And basically killing our cash flow overnight, right? So suddenly mm -hmm. we went from, oh, we have decent cash coming in the door. We can do these plans, right? And um, to having no cash coming in the door, looking at our bank balance and being basically realizing that we were four weeks away uh, from probably having to shut down the whole company because wow. we had enough cash in the bank to, you know, we, we always want to do things properly. So like we had enough mm -hmm. cash in the bank to like, refund all those tickets do it properly like um but um you know redundancy in the uk would you know you'd have to pay two three months salary all that kind of stuff so like we had enough cash in the bank to run for a while but at the same time if there was no cash coming in the door then it's like okay well the point at which we have to make that decision is is four weeks out so that was wow. terrifying in many ways not you know i think our priority order in that point was like okay how do we save this team because there are 15 people who full-time you know work for mm. us and and rely on us and have mortgages and families and all that kind of stuff and then the second point was how do we save the community because like if this thing does go out like how do we keep this alive in some way so that you know it can continue to exist and at least protect product tank and stuff like that and then probably somewhere f farther down the priority list was like what does that mean for us personally as mm. the founders and so that's when we um you know we were already talking about it but we really had to accelerate kind of planning uh, a pivot basically like we had to find other revenue streams we couldn't rely on the conference and event stuff anymore luckily we'd been experimenting with our online training or our training moving kind of to a virtual or online format so we started doing that um and then the big one for us was really trying to pivot to a membership model where it's a premium subscription service and the way we think about it is basically that it's a conference, but it lasts all year, right? So you get a ton of amazing content, community, all that kind of stuff, but you pay a subscription service for it and it's all delivered online. And we actually managed to get that out. I think it took us six weeks to build it, the first MVP. It took us about nine months to clean up all the tech debt after that, but that's <laughs> another conversation. Um, 
And in the meantime, also the UK government came out with uh, what they called the furlough program, which is kind of supporting businesses like ours in mm. being able to um, support our staff. So we basically had to send home, I think, half the team, but they were their salary was 80% covered by the government while that was happening so that we didn't have to lay anyone off mm. and we could rebuild basically. And, and so we managed to do that through the online training. Um, we ran a, a digital conference or two actually last year uh, to replace San Francisco and London. And then this membership program, which we've been building up and, and now has thousands of members to kind of replace some of that revenue stream. And luckily now we've been able to bring everyone back from furlough um, and, you know, the, the company stabilized, but it was definitely a, a terrifying and highly stressful couple of months over the summer last year. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And and thank you for being so so honest and, and open about it. You know, I was, I was a little bit hesitant to to ask the question, but yeah, this is the product and sensor show. And I think the how how the team has managed to really move and, and still be healthy, I think is really a, a, a success story in terms of you know really understanding the mood. And, and then trying to, you know, do whatever it takes to, to really survive this. So, yeah, that's, that's really incredible. That's really incredible. So I, I suppose then the, my next question would be, what do you think product looks like post-COVID, right? Because in, in, in this last, you know, 13, 14 months or whatever, a lot of things have changed. A lot of assumptions that we've made about even our craft has has changed. Like for one easy one that I I I, I actually said it in, in the time when I was giving a talk in MTP as well was, you know, for so long many product leaders were very not keen on remote work, and suddenly, mm. you know, in a blink of an eye, we've been doing it for fourteen months, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. In fact, you know, uh, um, surveys and polls seem to indicate that a lot more people have realized that it's doable and this mm. is the kind of work arrangement that they want where they don't have to go in every time. And of course, most of them said they wanted that sort of either or rather than, yeah. than you know, just make you choose one or the other. And so, yeah, what do you think product is going to look like post-COVID? What has changed? What's going to continue changing? What's going to stay the same? Yeah, I think, I mean, the remote thing, I was for a very long time uh, until actually probably we you know started building up the team for minor product. I was, I was a big believer in the importance of co-located, right? I always made it a part of the point of like, and I think in, a, in reaction to what remote used to look like was, oh, well, we have a dev team. You know, when I worked at Monster, our dev team was originally in Boston and then we built a European center in Prague. And so the dev team's in Prague and the product manager's in London. And it's like, that was what remote used to look like. Mm. And that doesn't work well, right? I think um, that's why I was always a huge believer in being co-located co so that you're sitting next to your team and, and you're working together on the problem. And as a as my the product, you know, we've been remote uh, from day one because we live all over Southeast England and long ass commutes are not something we want to <laughs> enforce on anybody. So, and we also did, didn't need the expense of an office. So we would get together once a week basically. And we had like, you know, team day, we'd just rent a meeting room somewhere and everyone got together and you basically had all your team meetings, but also like your all hands and updates and that kind of stuff. And then everyone goes back and works from home. So that was kind of our, our normal operating procedure anyway. Mm. And through that kind of realizing that the remote thing does work very well if you're intentional about it, right? Mm. And I think that's what we've seen over the last year where it's been enforced, right? I think it's just accelerated that trend of seeing that remote works uh, as long as a couple of things are true one everyone's remote right so everyone's at the same you know everyone's on a zoom call not five people in one room and two people somewhere else like that yeah. that doesn't work <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and i think it works and it's worked for us because we already had amazing relationships and stuff like that like i'm in awe of the people who have started new jobs over the past year or you know started and scaled companies over the last year where you're bringing you know brand new people into a fully remote environment um, and being able to make that successful is like amazing to me because I think going forward to your point, I think remote is going to be more or less the new normal. I think mm. we're going to spend most of our time remote. I think, we'll, you know, companies will still have offices. We'll go in two or three days a week kind of thing, uh, but have the option. Uh, but I think we're also just, everyone's going to have that much more understanding for what it means to be remote and how to engage with each other over a zoom call 
how to be respectful of that, um, things like that. But also realize that I think the most successful remote companies, you know, who have been early advocates for it, they invest in it, right? It's not a way to make it cheap of like, oh, well, we yeah. can hire cheap teams abroad or whatever. It's actually, you probably spend as much as you would on the office in quarterly catch-ups and everyone comes together and, and sits together in a room and, and has an offsite and all that kind of stuff. Because there are some things that I, you know, I've definitely struggled with over the last year, like those whiteboard moments where you just want to get together with a team and like think about what's coming next and what's the oh, five, yeah. 10 year thing look like and how do we think about the strategy and rethink stuff. Um, the day-to-day -day execution where you actually need your head down, you need that focus time. It's super easy to do at home and do remote, but you need that face time uh, in order to really gel a team as well, I think. So yeah. I do think we'll see remote being more or less than you normal. I think that'll be different for different companies. like where they already have a geographic nexus, people might come into the office two or three days a week. I know you're in a fully remote company now, right? So yep. I'm hoping like you guys will be investing in that and meeting each other and that once once we can travel again and stuff like that to to get nice. that face time and get that strategy time and, and stuff like that. And then go back home and be remote. Like I think I think that's a very natural thing. Mm -hmm. And what about what about um, product management in Asia, right? Because one of the things that was interesting was, you know, uh, Minor Product decided to to start a APEC conference yeah. um, that was in Singapore in 2019. Unfortunately, 2020 got sort of moved to digital because of COVID. Yeah. What, but what, what are your thoughts in terms of product management in Asia moving forward? Like, what well, does the future I'm hold? Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited about it. And I think one of our big missions at Mind the Product is to say that, you know, not all the good stuff and product comes out of the valley, right? Mm. Yes, there's a ton of stuff we can learn from them. They they have, you know, been trailblazers in many ways. And there's obviously super successful companies there that we can take for inspiration. But there's also amazing stuff happening all over the world, right? Here in London, there's amazing startups. In Berlin, there are amazing startups. In Singapore, KL. Yeah, Jakarta, um, you know, Australia, there's amazing startups all over the world that are trying different things, right? We were talking about Sharif earlier in Atlassian, right? Out of Sydney, like the stuff that we can learn from them. And, you know, we put him on that stage in Singapore because we wanted to share those lessons and share that story. Uh, and the same, I think, you know, we had, we just had MTP come digital for APAC again, sadly couldn't do it in person in Singapore. And we really tried to, you know, we had a couple of, uh, speakers from from the US, um, but most of everyone else from, was from across Asia pack and really just sharing those stories and like, this is how we tackle that problem. And here's how we're trying to move this thing forward. And here's how we're trying to change that culture. But also celebrating those successes, right? Like Gojek and Grab who have shown that you can build multi-billion dollar mm. businesses out of Southeast Asia. Like that's amazing. Yeah. Why aren't we talking more about those stories, right? Like we can be just as inspired and, and learn stuff from them as we can from from the big American names. And so that's really why we started the conference was to um, help that happen, basically. And again, not to, you know, not to put us on the stage. And it's not we're not there to kind of tell Asia what to do. We're there to elevate the the voices from Asia and share what you guys are doing because we think there are incredible stories there. Um, and I actually think there's there's things that are happening in uh, Southeast Asia, especially that are even more interesting to look at than what happens in other places, right? You look at Grab and Gojek and their kind of user research talk about remote, right? Like they have countries and markets all over Southeast Asia that they can't do the face-to-face -face as well. So they've been figuring out how to do that. We can learn a ton from that. I think there's mm. also fascinating stuff around the intersection of kind of the Chinese, you know, super app where a million services in, in one product. And then there's the Western, you know, one thing, one product, one app. And Southeast Asia seems to be experimenting with something in, in the middle, right? Which works mm. for that culture and that market. And again, there's, there's fascinating things that we can learn from that. And now you're seeing uh, Western apps kind of copy some of that, right? With Uber and Uber Eats kind of being more integrated and things like that. And that's purely influenced by what's been happening with Grab and Gojek. So that's fundamentally why we want to support that community and, and do something as a conference in Southeast Asia is to elevate those stories and show that, hey, there's awesome stuff happening here. You guys should be proud of that and also learn from each other and, and then teach the rest of us because we can all learn from you as well. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. So with that, I think we're going to go to the last segment of the show. Um, and this is, uh, I always tell people, this is my favorite part, which is, you know, we talk about a, a song that you chose. Um, you chose a song. Well, actually, I'm not going to say it. I'll let you introduce it. So why don't you tell us the artist and the song and why why you chose that song? 
So I actually gave you two choices because I have pretty eclectic uh, music taste and I listen to a lot of stuff. And I think especially over this last year, like I, I've had my stereo going the whole time here in the office and it's just been, a, you know, music to me is a, is a great escape, but also kind of either focusing the mind or clearing the mind, like depending on, on mood and, and things that we need. So I ended up choosing um, Michael Kiwanuka, who's one of my favorite artists. I discovered him a couple of years ago. He's now obviously blown up recently. Um, and I picked a song called You Ain't the Problem, uh, which I love uh, and has, again, just been on repeat, I think, over this last year because um, the album came out the tail end of 2019, I believe, or the beginning of 2020. But yeah. Okay. And what was it that you liked about that particular song? I think there's a there's a couple of things. So it's just a happy song somehow. It's just like it's got a good beat to it. It's just, you know, there's even like in the beginning, there's some like party sound in the background. So you hear like happy people. It's just a happy song, right? I actually had to the point where it's now my alarm clock song, right? So <laughs> oh, wow. okay. phone every morning like starts with this track. Um, and it's just like it's it's a happy beat. It's a happy song. And then the lyrics like he's a he's a awesome lyricist, I think. And like he's. The, when I first heard it, I took away that, you know, he's he's singing about love and like, it's not, you know, you ain't the problem and like there's pain in the world, but like it's not your fault kind of thing. And, and very much, you know, I'm a hopeless romantic at root. So that's kind of what I took away from it. And then as we were talking about this track and in, uh, in preparation for the show, I actually did some, a bit more research. Uh, and it turns out what, what he's actually singing about and the, what inspired him to write it. Uh, was his imposter syndrome uh, in the music industry. And he was thinking like, uh, he doesn't know what it takes to succeed. And like, it, but it's not, it's not him. You ain't the problem. Uh, and obviously like, I'm very open about me having a ton of imposter syndrome for the craft that I do. And so it turns out it has an even deeper connection for me. Wow. Well, I didn't even know that. So yeah, that was super cool. And yeah, I, I, I took a listen. I really liked the vibe. It was like you said, right? Yeah. Very upbeat. It's got, it's got this little, almost like this um, rock and roll feel to it. This is like this. Yeah. And a bit of like 60s. Yeah. It's the 60s, and a little right? Soul in there somewhere as well. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's my very eclectic music taste. I think again, like I just like that kind of combination. Yeah, it's, it was very nice because at first I was like, when I was listening to it, I was like, oh, is this is this something from back in the day? And then goes, no, yeah. it's not. It, and 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 to be fair, I don't listen to to Michael Kiwan, Kiwanuka at all. So yeah, this was this was really great. And this is one of the things why I enjoyed this part of the show because then I get to get introduced to all kinds of music. In fact, um, yeah. I got introduced to what one artist I can't remember his name now. Um, was a, was a lo-fi artist and I'm like, oh I loved it and then now I'm getting my Kinawuka and uh, Kiwanuka and before that was like yeah so so many options and it's it's amazing so this this yeah. is why I love it so yeah thank you so much uh, Martin for being on this episode of the Product Uncensored show um again thank you for being super honest super open super transparent I think I don't know about our listeners and our viewers. I'm sure they have, but I have definitely learned a lot. And I, I think I know, you, I feel like I know you so much better because of the experiences and, and all of that. So thank you so much. And just before we go, um, standard closing would be, do you have anything that you want to leave with our listeners or our viewers or yeah, any, any famous you know, words or, or words of wisdom? I think I just want to end with a with a thank you. I think thank you to you for having me and and thank you for everything that you do for the community as well. I think you know, we we've, we've always seen the the amazing work that you do in KL and and always felt like you're part of the the big, you know, family even though you might not be officially and we kind of don't care about that, right? It's it's all one product community and we're all trying to help out. So, thank you for doing that and thank you for letting me be on the show even though I'm not in Southeast Asia and, and share some of my insights and and I look forward to hearing the rest of your guests as we go forward uh, and really you know just just let us know how we can support the product community across Southeast Asia even more because we we would love to learn more from you guys as well Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that was Martin Erickson, who is the chairman of Mind the Product, who's also the operating partner at Equity Ventures. Um, it's been a really, really great episode. And again, you know, I think more than anything, what drives me to continue to run this is because of the great conversations and the great people that I get to interact with, you know, and I get to do it all in the guise of, hey, I want to talk to you, but I get to learn so much more. Um, so thank you all for listening and watching. And yeah, if, you, if you've if you enjoyed it, you know, give it a like, 
put a comment. I don't know, do whatever you do. And keep being awesome. And I'll see you guys at the next episode. Thank you so much. And bye-bye. <laughs>